Hello, my name is Anderson Pierre White. Many of you will know me from my 4x4 and overlanding videos and books. I'd like to share with you now a new YouTube channel that I have started. I actually started it a while ago, but I've kind of given it a good revamp now. And the idea of the channel is to share with you how I do what I do. What equipment do I use to film? How do I film? How do I edit? How do I package the stories? How do I earn income from it? And how, in a nutshell, have I got what I consider to be the best job in the world? I mean, for me, it's the job that I've always wanted. How did I get here? The journey, I think, is quite interesting. I'll share with you everything that I know about doing what I do. Now, this very first video was shot about a month back busy working in my garage late one night on my true carrier, Western Australia, building it for a major trip in July. And I just literally just picked up the camera, pointed at myself and started talking about how I got here. And that gave me the inspiration for this new YouTube channel. I hope you enjoy it. It is Friday night, it's half past 10 in my garage, working on my trippy and contemplating what I have in front of me. This is really a vlog for those of you who are really following my work, then keep watching. It might be a bit boring to those of you who don't know my work, actually, probably find another video to watch. This is gonna be quite boring. It's a little bit of insight into the background of what I do and how I do it, and why I do it. Um, I do this, as you probably know, as a, as a full-time job and um, I've managed to secure for myself a, a lifestyle that is, I'm having more fun now than I think I've probably ever done professionally. Um, my background is television editing. I spent 16 years in the advertising industry working in Johannesburg and um, I left school and got into, uh, fil I, wanted to be, I wanted to be a filmmaker. And I was told, get into editing, get into editing. So I became an apprentice film editor. Landed a very, very nice job because, and when I say it's very, very nice, I was paid very little. I worked extremely hard. Weekend after weekend, night after night after night. But that's the kind of thing that one does in the film industry. But I say it's a great job because it was a great break. I'd had a break. You know, I'd, I'd really stepped in it. And um, for three years, I was an apprentice and then my editor that I was, I was her assistant, uh, she took ill uh, right in the day when the, we were very, very busy. And um, I remember my boss coming down saying, says, Andrew, you're going to have to edit this. Oh, how terrible. So I got to edit a commercial and the commercial was uh, Cerebos salad dressing. When Cerebos prepared their dressings, they came up with something different. With new Cerebos dressing, you can't tell the bottom from the top because they're specially prepared. No shaking, just pour and you get an even helping of herbs and spices. There's Cerebos mixed garden herbs, tomato, onion and garlic, sweet peppers and parsley, and lemon parsley with chili. Each with its own unique fresh taste. New Cerebos dressings, specially prepared, so you can't tell the bottom from the top. And I, I remember it was very easy to edit, very easy to cut. Um, but what was more challenging really was the, the presentation that I had to do for client, agency, then client, and then all of the, and I did the entire production on my own. And it went very smoothly. So eventually after another three or four months, I was given another one. And then I was given another one. And then would you know it, my editor, her name was Marcel, she was offered another job, she left, and I became junior editor. So again, fell into my lap. And that was after I'd been there. I'd been editing for about, I suppose, four years I'd been with the company. And I stayed with them for another year, year and a half and I, as the junior editor. And I did some rather nice jobs. This commercial is about to demonstrate the deadly effectiveness of bacon from Bayer. 
see, even the cap works. My friends used to say that I always landed my bum in the butter, which is was not altogether true. But um, I edited a picture for Blossom Margarine for an, a director called Ashley Lazarus. Hello? I think he's out. Out to lunch. Oh. Great friendships blossom with the great taste of blossom. Who is a big time director. He was one of the three top, the big three top directors in South Africa. He also did a lot of feature films and he did all of the Peter Stuyvesant, the Paul Revere's, all of the big Rembrandt grooms, Castle Lager, Lion Lager, uh, the big banks. He was a, he was a, the big cheese when it came to directors. And I remember editing this picture for him and after we looked at the rushes, which are the dailies, the footage, I said to him, he said to me, I'll see you in the morning. And I said, no, you won't. You won't see him in the morning. You'll see me tomorrow afternoon. And he looked at me strangely and I said, if you want the best out of me, you'll leave me alone. And I remember his producer looking at me as if, how dare you talk to Ashley like that? He had that much stature. But Ashley was a different, he was different to everybody else. He was, he was a big cheese, but he was, he was a really great human being. And he smiled at me and he said, I can't believe that you said this to me. He looked at his producer and says, I've got tomorrow off. What am I'm going to take my wife out for a long breakfast. He was so happy. He came in at 2, 3 in the afternoon, I don't remember the time. Liked what I'd done a lot. We had a rapport immediately. Immediately we had a rapport. We just got on. And he, he, I learned an enormous amount from that man. And I actually was headhunted after I did a number of pictures for him. I was headhunted by a post-production company and uh, I edited Ashley Lazarus's pictures, almost all of them, for approximately four years. I did a whole lot of the great cigarette adverts, uh, Paul Revere. I did about I did five, Paul, uh, uh, five or six Steve, uh, Peter Stuyvesant. Peter Stuyvesant, alive, vibrant. Full of fun, Peter Stuyvesant, the international passport to smoking pleasure. And uh, lots of beer, all of the big, the blue chip clients. I was good at editing. The reward of the great outdoors, that feeling of freedom, wide open spaces. It was, I, I suppose my teacher, firstly Marcel, was a good editor and I learned a lot from her. Ashley was a wonderful editor and I learned an enormous amount from him. So I had great teachers. And became Conan. And I had a bit of a knack for it too. So again, bum in the butter. And, and I loved editing, absolutely loved it. Then we were editing 35 millimeter film and um, we, we were moving into the, the digital era, sorry, not digital, video era, moving from film to video. So we went and started editing on what they call offline U-matic, big thick videotape, but they were linear. So you add that shot, then that shot, then that shot, then that shot. It was, it was and all the spirit went out of editing when I, when I got into video because you, I didn't have the creative freedom. And also holding celluloid, actually holding film and winding, it's, a, it's wonderful stuff. It has a, a life of its own. And I lost interest in, in editing. And I continued and I had my own post-production company and I made quite a bit of money. I, I did well. I owned two houses, two four-wheel drives, an aeroplane, and I was doing okay. But I began to hate it. I began to hate the advertising industry. And while I'd, I'd I, you know, had the four-wheel drives and I was driving them around and, and, and having fun with them and I was thinking about, you know, one day I should write a book. Because people started asking me a lot of questions because they knew that I was doing these lovely trips in my Range Rover and people were asking me, well, how do you, where do, how do you, how do you do that? How do you, you know, come back from Botswana after two weeks in this incredible adventure with beautiful pictures? How do you do that? So the idea of 
writing a book came up. My birth, first book was actually published in, in 1993. But I got tired of advertising the advertising industry and eventually, I mean, I would have, not kidding, I, I've never been into drugs, ever, even when I was just out of school. I, I just, I've never touched drugs. I just, they just, I've never been, in, even, even a joint. My mates used to smoke. I never touched this stuff. Something about it just didn't, I didn't want to. My clients, my, the director and Ashley had gone to the United States, so he was no longer a client, but other, other directors. And he, they would snort cocaine. They would take my pictures, my beautiful pictures, framed pictures off the wall of my editing room. And, they w and he would sniff cocaine off them and drink copious amounts of, of, uh, of whiskey, al alcohol. I've never been a big drinker. And the, and the egos in the advertising industry, oh! And eventually I just had to get out. I just had to, I had to do something differently. And at the time, I had met Gwyn and uh, we'd been dating for two or so years, maybe more. And um, we got, soon after, very soon after we got married, I said to her, we've got to do something different. I just, you know, and she was in about the same place. She'd been doing copywriting and various things like that. Well, we both decided we wanted to just have a sabbatical escape. We sold a house, we sold aeroplanes, sold stuff, stole stuff, uh, kept the Land Rover, sold my Range Rover, and um, and that's when we went to the Okavango for our year, which was 91, 92, and we wrote the book Torn Trousers. There is a place so tranquil that angels go there to rest. It is a place of such singular beauty even the lilies dress for dinner. Yet the ebb and flow of its life-giving water is determined by a climate a thousand miles away. The water level is high during times of drought and low in times of rain. At its heart a river that seeks the sea but never finds it. This was where my heart lay, in the Okavango Delta, in northern Botswana. In that case, what was I doing, living in a crime-ridden city? What would it take for us to escape? My wife, that's what. Torn Trousers is the true story of how a 30-something couple, Andrew and Gwyn, and their Siamese cat sold everything houses, cars, aeroplanes, aer fired clients, and escaped to a desert island in the Okavango Delta. Woefully inexperienced, we took control of a luxury lodge where the rich go game spotting while sipping G&Ts. Trouble soon followed. Torn Trousers is available from Amazon in digital, softcover, and audiobook. Some of you may know Torn Trousers has become a bestseller. It's doing extremely well, still selling very, very well. And Torn Trousers, if in a way, is my genesis. It was while I was in the Okavango. Now, the Okavango is an amazing wonderland in Botswana. We were 100 kilometers from the nearest vehicle. Yet I wrote a book about vehicles. It's powered by solar power, the computer, powered by solar panels. The whole camp was either gas or solar. And um, that book was actually only published two years ago, February 2014, if I remember correctly. That book was published. It might have been 15. Doesn't matter. And that, 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 that book came out 20 years after the actual event, but it, it took us that long to actually get to the point where we felt we could actually do it justice in terms of telling the story. And I credit Gwyn with that because she writes writes fantasy novels and she's a very skilled writer and a skilled storyteller. But after we came back from Botswana, I did a bit of freelance editing, I did a bit of freelance photography, and then we moved to Cape Town and started a full-time publishing business. And I wrote, a, I wrote, um, am I, we wrote 93, 94, 95, we co-wrote three books. And then the publisher, we were we were, uh, who were publishing our books, went bankrupt. The name was William Waterman. 
and uh, a big publisher wanted to buy them out, but they would only buy them out on one condition, and that was that our titles stayed with the new publisher. And we thought, you know something? We could make a go of this. We could actually make a business out of writing books, and we thought maybe we should do some videos, maybe we should do some maps, and we basically packed up our film industry background, left Johannesburg, because Johannesburg had become a very difficult place to live in. The crime was awful, and I, none of us liked Johannesburg very much. It had become a, not a nice place to live. It once was, but it became awful. And Cape Town was almost like an island in South Africa. It still is to some degree. And um, the lifestyle in Cape Town and, and is quite different. And we, we were very successful. And we did that basically until we left South Africa in 2013. And during that period of time, we, we were the first people to do 4x4 VHS tapes. And I remember having an going to an expo. I used to go up to Johannesburg once a year to do an expo, every year. And we had the best show ever. It was a three-day show. We had four products, two books, two, two videos. The video, one video was driving a 4x4, the other one was recovery, 4x4 recovery. And we were literally, my assistant, she was tearing open boxes and I was signing them, taking the money, signing them, taking, we did that for three days. We made a packet of money. We had to get stuff, more stuff sent up. We didn't have enough stock. It was fantastic. And that business kept us going and we then had a family and it kept us alive and did really well for us until 2013 and at that time it was closing in on us. I sold the mapping business we did. I did I think 16 map titles if I remember correctly. There were f six DVD titles. We were all the first people to do DVDs. We were the first people in South Africa to publish maps with the GPS coordinates on them. That was a, a business called InfoMap. It still exists. They still do mapping in South Africa. Tracks for Africa kind of killed that for us because they had resources that we didn't have and their product, mostly, most of their products is very, very good. And so I couldn't really compete with their resources, but it was a very good business that lasted, I suppose, about nine years or so. We had that business for about nine years and it was lucrative, good business, great fun, lots of traveling, lots of map research. I loved drawing maps. I actually hired somebody as a full-time map drawer I love maps, so it was a natural progression. DVDs, uh, we, I reckon we've sold, uh, I never actually counted, but it's probably in the region of 50,000 DVD, DVDs we, told, we sold in total, and books, it's over 100,000 books, hard copy books in total. Now, of course, our business is purely digital, and in the digital era, has made what I do now possible. It's absolutely wonderful, because I can now do what I've, I suppose, everything I've been doing up to this point has been leading up to this point. It's all kind of fitted in. And while I no longer live in Africa, and I miss Africa terribly, I don't miss living in South Africa at all, but I miss Africa. I have an African, part of me is African, because of all my exploration. And I'm about to go exploring Australia, which I'm really excited about. And as I sit here building the Land Cruiser, I keep rolling back. I want to do some solo trips. And now I'm doing canning stock in, in, in three or so months' time. And all of these, you know, and I'm preparing this for my adventures in Australia. But I haven't come to Australia to make videos. I'm going to make videos here because I live here. But I will be back to Africa. I've actually been back every year since I have left in 2013. This might, I might not go to Africa this year. Um, I've been invited to Iceland, which if the... That's very unusual, extremely unusual. It's normal, it's such a quiet street here. Anyway, hoons they call them. Um, and so I've been invited to Iceland and if the Patreon support is good enough, I'll get to Iceland this year. If not, I'm going to try and get there next year. I will make it to Iceland. Iceland's been on my top of my bucket list for such a long time that I, I will make it there. But if I do go to Iceland, it means I won't go to Africa and it'll be the first time in 42 years 
that I actually haven't stepped foot on African soil. I love travelling in Africa. I feel very at home in Africa, particularly in Botswana and Namibia and Zambia. And I've got a trip planned. How's this for an idea? to investigate the best places in Africa, south of the equator, to camp and watch game at the same time. Many are in national parks, some are not. And I know the subcontinent very well. I don't know Zambia particularly well, and I don't know Tanzania at all. So Tanzania will be new for me, Zambia will be my second, or my third trip, but my second major trip. And I won't do Namibia again, but I will do Botswana extensively. How about that for next year? That's what I'm thinking about doing. And what I would love to do is build a vehicle in Africa. I would love to build a vehicle in Africa and actually have it there. You know, I was thinking maybe an 80 series Land Cruiser or 105 Land Cruiser diesel and just have it parked in, in Africa so I can just know it's there. Air tickets from here to Africa are not hugely expensive. They're not cheap, but they're not hugely expensive. And uh, with the weak currencies in Africa, it's not overly expensive to, to go there and, and get around. So you caught me on a Friday night, and I just thought I'd grab my camera and come and tell you a little bit of my history, which has led me to this point where I don't stop working because actually having fun is not as much fun as working. Honestly, it's not. Because I'm working now, I'm preparing my vehicle, but I'm not working. I love doing this, this is what I do. So I take the, word out of, the words out of Stephen Fry's mouth, work is more fun than play. I'm, I'm, I feel privileged that I've got to this point. And so keep watching and thank you for indulging me with this little bit of sharing about my of how I managed to find my way here. That's not what I was going to talk about. I was going to talk about plans I've got in Australia, but it kind of just, with my thoughts, took me elsewhere. There's some amazing, this place has got some astonishing places to visit. Absolutely out of this world. I shall be getting there, and I hope you will come and share my journeys with me.